Okay. Uh, greetings, everybody. This is Module 5 of the Quality Student Enroll um, Enrollment Functional Training. Let me turn that down a little bit, hopefully. Um, and today's topics are a little bit disparate. Um, they're obviously related, but they're, um, they're concepts that cut across the entire enrollment module. So there's the academic record, um, which will probably take up the bulk of today's training. Um, and that's where a lot of the information about a student's experience at the, at the institution is recorded, and Dan Simons will present that. And then we'll talk about holes um, and exemptions. And again, holes are things that happen in a variety of contexts. Um, prim the primary use is probably within the registration realm, but they obviously show up in, in other places of the enrollment application and exemptions as well. You know, what we've come to find in, in our business requirements gathering is just about any rule can be exempted so that it kind of shows up all over the place. So today is a bit of a grab bag of topics. Um, so if you want to advance, here, Simon. So um, I'm Carol Bershad, uh, and again, I'm the analysis team lead and the product manager, and I'm located at the University of Washington. And then um, Dan Simons is going to talk to us about the academic record, and he's um, both a subject matter expert and a business analyst from the University of Maryland. Um, Hugh Parker, who's a business analyst at University of Washington, will cover holds and exemptions. And as always, we have Cheryl Medley, who can help out with some of the logistics of the presentation. Um, We've got Bob Jansen, who's going to be our critical observer today. And again, as always, you can find more information about the training and all the supporting documentation on the wiki page. Go ahead. <laughs> and just to remind you, um, hopefully this is, this is pretty familiar by now, you know, the, the goal of, of these enrollment, tr um, or enrollment training sessions is really just to give you an understanding of the functional framework, the way we're thinking about the enrollment module and the associated business artifacts as they currently stand. Now that we've moved into parallel delivery, we're starting to get much more specific um, about the design. Um, but this is really focused more on the business side of the application. Uh, this, again, this module, um, there's a typo there that should say module five objectives, um, is again, just to give you that kind of insight on the academic record holds and exemptions. So I think that's all the setup. Oh, one more. So um, if you recall this diagram, which kind of shows the application at a glance, um, the module at a glance, really the areas we're focused on now is kind of what's at the core of the enrollment module, is, which is academic record. And then we also have the holds and exemptions, which cut across, again, all the different functional areas. And there's both the student-facing aspect. Um, students will um, request exemptions. Institutions will grant those exemptions. Like students will place institutions will place holds on students, students will request that those holds be removed or work to resolve those holds. So there's both an institution-facing aspect and a student-facing aspect to, to these three topics. So I think that's probably all the overview that we need. I think we can get right into um, the academic records. I'm going <laughs> to... <Okay>. This, <is, laughs> this is Hugh's slide. Hugh, you want to say something about this slide? <laughs> Just a comic. explanatory. <laughs> so just a moment, it's Terry Paws for a little humor. OK, so now I think we're going to get the academic record. All right, Dan, Thank I'm going gonna, gonna to go on mute. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Dan Simons. All right. So um, I'm Dan Simons. Uh, remember from last time, uh, just chime in if for some reason you can't hear me. I don't know if you can see the video, but the, the Polycom mic is planted into the table <laughs> a couple of feet away from me. So if I come out too quiet, yell, and I'll try to yell back. Um, also, when I get excited about something, I tend to talk really fast. So feel free to throw up a red flag if I start talking faster than you can hear me. Um, so feel free. We're going to have plenty of time. We don't have enough material that will take the four-hour spot. So there's plenty of opportunities to chime in and make fun of me or ask a question or something like that. So anyway, let's get started with academic record. So academic record, funny enough, was one of the more challenging areas for us to align in conceptually. Um, 
I mean, it, it sounds like something very normal, and for somebody who spent 15 years working and managing these systems, it seemed very common sense to me until it came time to define it. A little tougher. Um, so a lot of what we're going to be doing today is kind of talking about how we can align our concepts of what the academic record is, um, especially when we think about the large group of people who are going to be involved in this effort. Um, knowing just when we had four registrars sitting around a table and the long hours of debate and discussion about what this meant, I can only imagine when you start throwing people that aren't subject matter experts like analysts and developers and their perspectives on these things, you start to get a really big mush of ideas here. So I think an important outcome that we want to try to achieve out of this presentation is just helping to align an anchoring concept to help us work from. So that being said, look, there's a definition. Um, so here's just a kind of a high level picture, some points that kind of help us understand academic records. And the big one is it being a collection of information related to a student's learning experiences at an institution. Um, this is kind of the crux of it. Um, when we think about what those learning experiences are, this could include courses taken, obviously the grades and the units you've received for that, um, when it was taken, programs that you're enrolled in or have been enrolled in at points in time, different ways of understanding that accumulation of learning experiences in those grades, so looking at um, grade point averages to kind of get a qualitative perspective of things and looking at unit totals to get a more quantitative perspective of the learning that's taken place. Um, different kinds of program outcomes like degrees and credentials are things that we classically understand as being part of the academic record. And there's other pieces of assessment that often come up on um, areas of the academic record that we record when we think of, say, probation, dismissal. For some institutions, you might record um, progression or benchmark, depending on how your institution does it. Um, a third aspect that's actually pretty important to think about is the idea of permanence. Um, this is information that we typically think of as permanent information. So again, when you think of it from a registrarial perspective and think about the retention of data and the retention of records, a good indicator is if you're keeping it permanently and you plan to keep that forever, um, you probably hit on something that might be the academic record. Um, and also, when we think about these things, they tend to be the basis for some official documents that we're all aware of. So when we think of um, academic transcripts that you might send from one institution to another, um, the academic record is the place that produces that. Oh, the other piece that kind of is involved here um, is the idea of person information. So PI is a component here, but it, it's not necessarily part of the academic record. The academic record is of person information and trying to make sure it has an identity of what this stuff relates to, as opposed to actually being the place where one manages the person. So just important to throw out there. So what is the academic record after all that? Um, you know, a lot of people think of the official transcript, like, well, I've seen the academic record. It's been sent to me. That's the record. Well. We recognize that's too narrow. That's simply one view of the surface of what really is the academic record. Um, we all know as institutions what we put on official transcript does not reflect all of the experiences that a student has had participating in our learning experiences at our campus. Um, it's just a light slice of it. So that we know is too narrow. Um, sometimes when we have these discussions, it gets open to, well, it's just an educational record, which we think of, you know, for people in the United States, we're used to FERPA, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, where they define educational records, but that's way too broad. That's any student data maintained by the institution. And we know we're not talking about your housing contract and that you bought roast beef on Friday night at the dining hall. All that's protected under FERPA, but that's not what we're doing with the academic record. And even when we try to narrow that down into just academic information, it's still too broad. Um, that still hits other information that really wouldn't raised to the level of something we'd consider to be the academic record. When we think of you know, transactional data, the fact that you attempted to register for math six months before classes started and didn't enter the course, did we really care? Um, that you sat in a section for five minutes while you're doing a section change in your early registration period, is that the academic record? 20 years from now, do we care that that happened? No, we don't. So we still need to find kind of a way of 
finding what are the edges and boundaries of this and where do we kind of find that spot in the middle where the academic record lives. So another way that helps us kind of focus in on what the academic record is, is that the academic record is really in interested in what you're engaged into. So for a learning experience, we don't care that you looked at a learning experience and thought about it. We don't care that you maybe even flirted with that learning experience in early registration. We care what you actually engaged in. That's where the academic record really comes in. And each institution is going to have a different perspective on what engagement means. But that's typically the way we look at it. For some institutions, it may be that, um, well, I'll use Maryland. So engagement for Maryland would be, you sat in that class after the 11th day in a semester, you are now engaged. Welcome aboard. We're going to put that in your record. If you dropped it on the 11th day, it still goes on your academic record. We document that you were there. It was considered to be a significant engagement in that learning experience and we have it. In contrast, like I mentioned before, that six months out you sat in that, you registered for the course and had a seat in that course for five minutes before you changed it to another course, oh, we don't care. We're not going to put that on your academic record and maintain that piece of information for the next 150 years. So as we kind of play with these ideas, as you're probably already getting a gist of just from these conversations, this is kind of a murky area where there's a lot of discussion that can happen on both sides about where you take it. So what we thought we'd do was approach this from several different angles. Um, one, kind of looking at the history of the academic record. Um, you know, when we look to where these concepts evolved from, it was pretty static uh, way back in the day. So kind of understanding where that evolved can kind of help us find some of those anchoring ideas to help guide us in how we create some boundaries for what we do in quality student. Uh, obviously, when we look at the data, well, what data is it? Obviously, the data in many ways defines the academic record. So we want to take a look at some of those data elements and talk through that. We'll also look at stewardship and monitoring. Um, so this is looking at how, especially registrars, look at this data and how we manage and protect that data. And that can help show us some paths that we might to understand the record. And obviously the processes, um, which in the work that's been done, that's probably got the most fidelity uh, in academic record. And those are, you know, what do we expect to accomplish as a business user in the academic record feature set? So that's how we'll kind of play with that. Oh, look, we'll start with history. Nice arrow, Carol. Oh, glad you like it. Yeah, I'm easily amused. I was flirting with the, uh, I'm engaged to the arrow. <laughs> I will record that on your academic record. <laughs> okay, so as an example, um, so what this is, this is actually the University of Maryland's very first academic record. Um, we were founded in 1859 by uh, Charles B. Calvert as the Maryland Agricultural College, I believe our first name was. And this is actually the first list of students who were registered at this university. Um, we'll zoom in a little closer. Okay. So interestingly enough, you know, Charles Calvert founded the institution. Go figure, his sons are the ones who started <laughs> the institution. So the first four students ever here were his children. Um, but this is an interesting example of one of the first centralized records for the university back from 1859. And you can see some of the information that's being captured. So we're seeing what we might call a matriculation, entrance matriculation date of seeing when they started with the institution. Most of the rest of the information is actually more PI data, person identity data. So it's looking at the name, the age, you know, 12, nice, um, you know, parent guardian, their address. And there's an area where they left, they left the institution. Um, blank data does not mean they never left, but, uh, you know, like we still have today, tracking when a person leaves is still a bit of a more art than a science, correct? Um, and it's also important to say, I mean, back in the 1850s, uh, most students didn't actually leave with a degree. I mean, you came to get some education, you know, the idea of leaving with a credential um, wasn't as common as you might think today. So some students left with degrees, most did not. But there's a kind of a picture of some of the first ways that these things were starting to come together as a centralized area. So where was all the other information being stored? Faculty. 
So the faculty were the ones keeping the grades, keeping the academic information in their books. And at that time of day, I mean that time of year, well, that's just time, there wasn't a large number of individuals that had to manage that. This is actually an exaggeration because this isn't the faculty of 1859. This is actually the faculty of 1898. So it's too big. But it was even smaller back then, but you get the idea, right? I think our yearbooks only go back to uh, 98. Um, so that's where it was being stored at that time. We weren't storing it in any kind of central fashion. So let's kind of advance a little bit and move on to uh, the early 1900s. We start to see a little bit of an evolution of that same concept that we saw before. So this was the entrance register. So what you saw before is being a big table and filling out. They've got more information they want to collect now. They've created a different style of doing it, but it's the same general idea. Um, this is Curly Bird. H. Clifton Bird, who nobody really knows about probably, but he was an infamous um, president at the University of Maryland, uh, football coach, baseball coach, uh, blah, blah, blah. If you watch college football, you'll know that we play in Bird Stadium. Ah, there he is. That's Bird. Okay. So this was his entrance record in 1905. Um, and you can see a lot of information that was similar to what we saw before. A little bit more. You know, it's good to know that he was a Methodist. I like knowing who his pastor is. It's very helpful, I guess. But you can start to see where things start to expand. So this is interesting to look at in the context of the next slide, which this, I went back a couple years to find one good. This is our friend Allnut. Um, he attended here in 1898. I don't know, he's not famous in any way. I don't know if it had something to do with nuts. I'm not sure really. but. Um, it's interesting, this was the first existence of centralized grading records at the institution. So if we, oh, and actually, if you want to know, Allnut is the guy standing in the upper left-hand side of the picture, just in case you wanted to, you know, know these things. So zooming in, um, it gets kind of interesting to start looking at this, because now we're starting to see things that are looking a little bit more like transcripts that we're kind of used to seeing. Um, not precisely, but it's getting closer. So we're starting to see numerical marks of the students are receiving throughout the process. And this is obviously one student. This is, he actually has four pages of academic record. I only chose to show you two of those pages. Um, you can start to see accumulated values. So they're actually creating learning result calculations that we have in quality. They're starting to appear now. They're numerical. Um, and they're based on averages. But they're still starting to accumulate these things. We're seeing rankings. He's ranked four. Well done. Probably the class was only, you know, 11 people. But still, rank four. Rank calculations were a lot easier back then. Um, and we can also see other things, like president's remarks. I thought it interesting looking through many of these books that they all have president remarks across all of them. This one, I forget what he said. Ah, uh, my best wishes. So he's been doing quite well. There were some other students that had some more deplorable demerits as they were uh, calculated on there and had some more choice remarks from the president, but I didn't save those. All our students look great. But you start to see some things that make sense. At the top, I don't know if you can see on your screens, but at that top, um, kind of vertically written, those are subjects. So that's where you can see the subjects the student was taking at the time. And I, can't, I can barely make it. I think Latin's in there and civics and French, yeah, a couple other things. Engineering I see in there. Let's jump forward another. So now let's move to the 20s. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with uh, the story of Ferdinand, but the author was Monroe Leaf. So this is his record from back then. Um, so we've now passed an important milestone here when it comes to the academic record, and that's we've passed the invention of the Carnegie unit. So now we see credits. Credits have started to appear. So by the 20s, most institutions in the United States have adopted Carnegie units. So we now have credits articulated throughout here. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting was you start to see the fusion of the PI information with the academic information. Because when you look at the top of that transcript, which is the academic record, I shouldn't even call it a transcript, this is the academic record. The top part is basically the entrance registry in many aspects. And the rest is starting to show the things the student actually accomplished their time at the institution. And this was the document that was continually updated 
every time the student performed more and more work at the institution. And uh, clearly, type, there's a typewriter now. Blah. No more handwritten things. So, but they just keep adding and adding and adding things. And you can even see, I thought it was kind of funny to look down at the bottom left hand, you know, oh, I had to add a course in that wasn't there at the time. I'll just sneak it in between lines. Classy. But it just kind of shows you how records are kind of maintained back then. But you can also see, we're now seeing degrees. Degrees are starting to go onto the document, which was something new. Before then, degrees were not documented on Maryland academic records. They were documented through um, a feature called the commencement program. <laughs> and still to this day, when we do research for old um, academic records from the early 1900s and the 1800s, um, when we have to find degrees, the document of records, the Institution of Maryland, is the preserved commencement program to determine that. We obviously don't use that now, um, but back then that was the way it was done. There's also now in these academic records a backside. We're starting to calculate more information for us and store more information. So we're having some early transfer credit concepts are starting to be recorded from where they came from. Um, Actually, I was surprised to see there's even requirement substitutions being documented on here if you look in the center um, related to a change of major. So it starts to get kind of interesting. And then for those of us who know records going out, you can see where his record was sent um, afterwards. So they recorded himself, obviously. Um, and he wound up going to Harvard after. So that's documented of where that record has been sent to. And there's some military things. A lot of military things from back then, given the time period. But kind of interesting to see how that's evolved a bit. So we move on 10 years later. Um, this one isn't dramatically different than the one we saw before. Um, Bill Guckison, I probably nobody knows who he is. Uh, famous Maryland uh, football player um, from that time period. And uh, um, he's a decorated military aviator from World War II. Um, this was his record from back then. Um, what's interesting now is you can see some other aspects of behaviors we're used to seeing now, but how it was handled on more of a static academic record back then. Um, major changes. We can see right up there, uh, you know, upper left-hand corner, you know. You change your major, change your college, let's modify that. We'll cross it out, type in a new one, you know, look at those modifications. You can see where we've removed a course in the upper right-hand side there, you know, very similar to how we kind of manage it today. We'll just cross it out. And if I think about how we do our records today when things are removed like that, uh, it still shows up on your record, but we'll mark that we removed it for a reason. And you can see grade modifications. You know, back then, cross out the old grade, type in the new grade. So in some ways, you can almost see you're kind of auditing it. Oh, what's the transaction history? Well, it's all on the piece of paper. So it's kind of funny to look at. And it's actually, uh, if you look in the upper center, you can even see some enumeration selection for underlining membership and guardian to identify the type of person and the type of uh, religion being identified. So, kind of just need a different kind of way of doing it. When did you stop playing track? Sam? What's that? <laughs> I said, when did you stop playing track and field? You, in that nice little outfit. <laughs> Good question. I don't know. It's very becoming. <laughs> it is very becoming. <laughs> Shows lots of legs. <laughs> uh, we can see a couple other things. Um, documenting when the curriculum changed that they were involved with. So we can see some of those major changes happening there. Some scholarships and honors have been awarded. Some more academic information there. And we can see again, he went up going to West Point after uh, after going to Maryland, so we can see that. So, and no, those pictures were not on the academic record, but you can actually see one that was. Uh, that's, well, all that's left is his nose and mouth, so I don't know, it looks like a, I don't know what that looks like, but funny enough, there's still stuff on there. All right, so let's move forward to, let's jump to a modern day academic record. So I was able to show you all those, because obviously those people are deceased, so I can show you those things. This person graduated a couple weeks ago. They're not dead yet, so I had to cross out their names. So I still have my registrar hat on. But now you're kind of seeing more of a, 
you know, a kind of typical modern record where it's computerized, and we know that behind the scenes there's a lot of data that's used to even support this kind of document. You're really just getting a slice off the top. So to kind of show some things we're starting to see on more modern records, um, we can start to see a lot more transfer credit information, and it's a lot more detailed than before. Um, in this particular example, this is an official transcript, so the only transfer credit that is displaying are those that were specifically applied to the student's undergraduate education. There may be a whole other dearth of transfer credit we documented and codified, but perhaps did not use towards their degree, which you'd see on a different kind of transcript. Um, we can also start to see some different aspects that we use for looking at courses. So we can see some of the specialized notes that we display on courses. So for instance, you can look in the lower left-hand corner. Developmental math has a non-credit notation onto it, and that belongs to the course. It's a special note to say that this is a, a not a credit-bearing course. So that's another aspect of data we're starting to see. Evaluations we're seeing in this case, you know, this is a good student. You've got uh, semester academic honors, that's, you know, dean's list, you know, you've got a certain GPA, um, 3.0 and 12 credits enrolled, it doesn't matter. So anyway, you can start to see that there. If they had been on, say, a negative um, assessment, like a probation or dismissal, um, you would see a dismissal there. We don't show our probations on official records um, in a line with accurate standards. And we can also start to see uh, separations from the institution. So if you look in the upper right-hand corner, we can start to see, you know, for that winter, they actually withdrew from the university, in that term, and we document that. The other thing that we start to see that um, is more of a, a piece of modern computerized records is we're starting to see ongoing learning result calculations or accumulations of GPAs and credits. And now in a computer, it's a little easier to kind of show a running tally of what's happening in terms of the credits they've earned, the GPAs that they have, both in a semester version, um, an ongoing cumulative GPA that continually is being expressed over time <coughs> throughout the record. And, um, oh yeah, so we're starting to see all that kind of stuff. So on page Two, we can also start to see where program completions, I mean, this is how Maryland posts, everybody has a different style of it, but here's just one example of posting of the degrees. This is the result <coughs> of the actual program itself. Um, here, besides seeing the type of degree it was and the program from which it came, um, we can also see other kinds of assessments and calculations, such as commencement honors. In this case, um, the person was uh, cum laude, so that's been documented there. And at the very bottom, you can see another type of learning result calculation, which are what we kind of call totals. Um, so in this case, these totals reflect not only the native work, which was part of the GPA and earned credits you were seeing in the other aspects, but it's also incorporating in terms of credit totals the transfer credit that we applied to the program. <coughs> 